Hi there, everyone. Michael A. Bryan here from the Oracular School of Astrology, and I'm very excited to be speaking with Melanie Reinhardt today. Hi there, Melanie. Hi, Michael. Same with me. Awesome. Awesome. I'm super excited to dive into just getting to know a little bit more about you. We spoke previously briefly and we didn't really go into all of the things so i'm i'm really happy and very honored to be able to have this conversation with you today well that's lovely but i feel the honor is mine really <laughs> well thank you thank you very much so just to give a little bit of a background about how this came to happen we met at a conference that we were both speaking at, and you were speaking on one of my favorite topics of all time, and that is the graphic ephemeris. And so I popped in for a bit, I, I caught a portion of your talk, and then afterwards you came to my talk. <laughs> right, <laughs> which was quite wonderful, really, I loved it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Can you just tell us a little bit about who you are and how you got into astrology? Okay, I first connected with astrology 64 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's true. It's true. <laughs> so I, w I was then nine years old, <laughs> and um, I was living in what was then southern Rhodesia. It's now Zimbabwe. I'd had a fall and broke my arm really badly, and so I had a lot of time off school because I was in this huge plaster cast and I couldn't move very well and all that. So I took every opportunity to not go to school. <laughs> and I actually liked school in the main, but somehow it was just too awkward, you know. <laughs> and it so happened that the, the, the National Library of Southern Rhodesia was pretty much right at the end of the street where we lived. And so I used to kind of stagger down there in, in my <laughs> plaster cast and spend the day in the library instead of at school. Now, Rhodesia being a very agrarian kind of economy, um, most of the library contained all kinds of resources for people in that kind of a profession. And there was one shelf, one shelf labeled philosophy, psychology, and religion, just one shelf, not a, a meter wide. And I was completely compelled to read about this stuff. So there wasn't much, but, you know, they were the kind of books, if you read any of them thoroughly and really thought about them, you would really learn a lot. So, you know, some of the collected works of Freud, some of Jung, a theosophy, Buddhism, the usual, the usual suspects. <laughs> <laughs> and there was one small book on astrology. And I deeply regret, I do not remember the, uh, the author or the title. But anyway, I opened it up and, of course, read my own sun sign first, which, <laughs> is, which is Gemini, so I would do. Okay. And I was absolutely compelled immediately but I also felt a certain sense of agitation and even some indignation because somehow I absolutely knew there was way more to astrology than what was in this little book it was just a, a small book about the sun signs and you know in in kind of old-fashioned language even for them because that was the 1950s <laughs> so I borrowed the book and kept on reborrowing and reborrowing. And I memorized all the sun signs, which seemed quite easy. And then for years and years, every person I met, I asked them when their birthday was. So I was trying to tally up what I'd <laughs> read in this little book with how I was perceiving the person and so on. So um, also a very Gemini thing, very, very <laughs> curious, curious, you know. So the next step was when I went down to Cape Town in South Africa uh, to, the, um, to the university there. And um, I, I was given a copy of Dane Rudyard's book called The Pulse of Life. 
and it was either my 19th or my 20th birthday, I forget. I still have that very same copy. It's been all over the place <laughs> with me. That was incredible. Again, I opened it at my own sun sign, and I kid you not, I, I just had some kind of epiphany because reading about my own sun sign, I felt, my God, this person I've never met knows me better than my parents did, even better than I do. And it was like this truly, the sense of a, a cosmic mirror, which was showing me and validating all kinds of things about myself that were deeply, deeply true. And in that moment, I knew that I wanted to follow this thread of astrology wherever it might lead me. It was amazing. Um, I should have actually fetched the book from my shelf. Okay. It's on the shelf just behind me, the very book, you know. And then um, eventually uh, wanting to follow the trail of this interest in astrology was one of the things um, that contributed to my decision to leave Africa and come over to England, which I duly did. And in my first few months there, I met a man who was a Sufi master who had a community, he focalized a community here in England. And I heard him give a talk at Friends House in Houston. That's, I mentioned that because um, uh, the, the London School of Astrology run by Frank Clifford they hold a lot of their classes in that very building. And I've taught in there myself when the faculty used to uh, used to hold classes there. So it's strange how things come around. Anyway, so I joined this community and um, it only turned out that this man was, was then the publisher, the main publisher of Dane Rajar's work and in the community library, there was loads of gorgeous first edition hardback copies, some of which I still have, um, of Dane Rajar's work. Um, and long story, but I eventually met Dane Rajar through this teacher of mine because, you know, they were having a business meeting and I accompanied him and that sort of thing. And one other little Rojo um, story. So I was living in Massachusetts, and in 19, 1975, autumn of 1975, Rojo came to New York to a place which was then called, I think, the Astrology Center or something. And um, I went down to New York to attend this which was just so special. And um, it, Dane Rojo was actually the one that gave me the shove to start working professionally, because in the many years in between, I had read whatever I could get my hands on, which, to be honest, wasn't actually that much back then. You know, it was before the great flood of astrological knowledge being published. Um, but I, and I taught myself to calculate charts and all that. Really, when I think of it, I have no idea how how I managed to do that, but I did, you know. <laughs> um, and he was he was the one that that gave me the push to start working professionally. So I did that very same autumn autumn. So that was 1975, and I'm still I'm still doing it. It's the only it's the only profession I've ever had. I'd be useless <laughs> to anything else. <laughs> and one final little bit. Mm -hmm. Wind forward to I think it was 2012. And I was invited by um uh NCGR, the New York chapter, to do some uh, to do some workshops for them. And I I 
think I remember rightly, they specifically asked if I would do something on Chiron. And so as I was there in New York, in the astrology world there, I suddenly remembered about this talk back in 1975 with the great the great man Dane Rudyard and so at the at, at the beginning of my talk I told this little anecdote because that was the, that that was the last time that I'd been in in New York was it was all that time and I said I don't suppose there's anybody who was there at that lecture the hands went up <laughs> it was so wonderful <laughs> yeah so that was there was quite a long time between you know my first finding the library book. That was nineteen fifty nine. I found the library book, then nineteen seventy five, and astrology was hundred percent part of my life all that time. I was sort of studying and thinking and observing and dreaming and all that you know. And wow. so that's when I started. And then <laughs> doing everything backwards, it was after all of that when I, I was already working professionally that I studied with the Faculty of Astronautics. <laughs> <laughs> and I put that down to having Mercury retrograde in the air <laughs> right? So I do everything backwards. <laughs> and I'm so glad I did that because I knew that left to my own devices, there were all kinds of things I would never study, really, because they weren't really my thing. I didn't didn't have enough left brain for that. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, that's been a wonderful journey, too, because I've been involved with the faculty since 1977, it was, when I started studying with them. And um, did the certificate and diploma, and then eventually became a tutor. And uh, then some years back, I think it was 2007, they invited me to be a patron, which fair nearly blew me over. <laughs> so, and, you know, making lovely friends and wonderful astrological community there. And I've been very fortunate because I've traveled a lot with my work, really a lot. And loved every minute of it, you know. So that's... Uh, that's a wasn't so brief, but <laughs> there, <laughs> there is the story. <laughs> it's completely fine, and thank you so much for sharing that. I mean, I I never knew about your connection to Rudyard, and I'm very curious. What was it about his work that <laughs> made you so compelled to specifically, like you said, follow that thread of astrology? Yeah, you know, I think it was, you know, well. The first was just the flash about my own sun sign because the way he spoke of it and indeed that whole book it it introduces the whole notion of the cyclic nature of the of the energies of the planets and to me that you know that kind of um it gave a context from for some of the rather atomized information that I'd got from reading books or indeed from my own observations. And the more I read his other works, um, that was a thread that I was continually inspired by. Um, the notion of this e exquisite universe within which there are these cycles which we're all participating in all the time, every moment. You know, even if we don't name it or study it, that is what's actually happening in our lives on Earth. And how, you know, it's like it's like a great, a, a great, um, a great, like a net woven from these threads, which are all the orbits of the planets, you know. That makes me think, I believe in Hinduism, there's the notion of the net of Indra. And it's just that notion is just utterly luminous to me to this day. Um, that was the main thing. And then I think, you know, having started exploring his work via the pulse of life, um, paradoxically, you know, and I, I loved his language because his native tongue, of course, was French. 
And I did study French at university and I was flu fluent for a while. But there's something so glorious about the French language in terms of its poetry. And to me, that comes through. So it's like he's speaking the poetry of the skies when he writes. And that, that so touched me, you know. Um, that that was the, that was really the main thing, and also the way he was able to um, engage with the broad collective themes, as well as the individual soul and its journey. You know, of of all of his books, well, obviously my favorite is the Pulse of Life because that was the origin of everything. But I think apart from that one, the one called New Mansions for New Men. I still read that. I've read it cover to cover. I don't know how many times. And in there, the language is so concentrated. And the, the vision that he's obviously inspired by seems to me so so foundational. You know, like he talks about the houses uh, as mansions. And, and on one page, he offers, well, yeah, in the section about the planets, he offers the metaphor of the planets being like gongs. And so that the, the sound or the tone of the energy of the planets kind of rings out through the vastness of space and all that. It's enough to make you faint. You know? <laughs> <laughs> mm. I've attempted to read one of Dane Rudyard's books, and I think it's the book on the eight lunar phases. And so... Oh, I, yes, the lunation cycle. The lunation, that book, exactly. And I remember I was reading it when I was leaving the Bahamas to go someplace because that's where I'm from. And I was on an airplane and I was reading through this book. And there was something about it that did pull me forward through it. But then I think that probably it's because of some of that poetry that you're speaking about. And he seemed to talk in such a big way in that book. It was very hard for me to really sink my heels into the content of it. But yes. I tell me. Yes. No, I totally understand that. I think for me, that step came through the work of Liz Green and Howard Susportis because both of them were also very connected with Rudyard's work, you know? And then adding in the psychological perspective, I felt that 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 gave a kind of landing pad <laughs> for me, <laughs> anyway, for, for some of the just exalted perspective and language that Rudyard offers, you know? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I also, and so they, they um, well, in, in the beginning when I met them, they didn't yet have a school. There was this wonderful place in London. This is a really down memory lane. This was the late 70s. Um, so the Cambodian embassy had been abandoned because of politics. This magnificent, magnificent, huge building along a road which is called Millionaire's Row, and that's where you get embassies and millionaires and all that. Um, and so it had been squatted um, with semi-permission because it, it had so many beautiful things in it that I think the council was just glad there was somebody who was willing to actually take care of it. And so in that very house, there were all kinds of incredible classes going on, you know, esoteric and meditative and that kind of thing. And that's where... Um, Liz and Howard used to hold their talks initially. And then in 1982, they formed the Center for Psychological Astrology. And then 10 years later, after Howard very sadly died, when they sort of changed the structure and so on and so forth, I was invited to teach there, which I did for another 10 years. And so uh, that, that was a, a deep immersion in the psychological dimension. And also, I studied studied psychology myself um, in 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 the training in psychosynthesis. 
So work for a while as a therapist. Um, but I always knew that that was own that my interest in that was only to support my astrology. I never had any ambition to be a therapist per se. Um, and that was very important. But I always was also studying all different kinds of spiritual teachings and, you, you know, t taking teachings from, from ma masters in their traditions, which was so wonderful. And, you know, back in those days, you know, London was an incredibly exciting place to live because any anyone who's anyone in any field always comes to London at some point. And so some of the best teachers of that period I got to study with or, you know, brief, attend brief things like weekends or whatever. And it was a very rich milieu of people who were all pilgrims on the spiritual path in one form or another. It was extraordinary, you know. I've been to London a few times because one of my Reiki teachers, he teaches in Manchester quite a lot. And so I would fly to Manchester, then fly to London. And I think one of the greatest parts of my London experience was going to Watkins. Watkins. I, I, I knew you were going to say that. What a place. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I forget how long it's been going, but a really, really long time. And it really is the hub of esoteric work. Have you been downstairs? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, when I first came over from oh. from Africa and I told you about the the one shelf in the <laughs> library, I walked into Watkins and I was <laughs> absolutely open mouthed. I thought I had died and gone to heaven. It was just <laughs> unbelievable. Unbelievable. It definitely is. Now, Melanie, one of the things that you are really known about within the astrological community, and definitely the first way that I heard about you, was in relation to not the asteroids in general, but specifically Chiron. Can you tell us a little bit about your journey with Chiron and how that became such an integral part of your work? Yeah. So, um, in 1997, uh, Chiron was discovered in 1977, and it took about six months before ephemerises were available. And I was already curious about it because of the name. Now, you probably know that it was the man who discovered Chiron that gave it the name, and the name stuck, and that is actually quite unusual. Even more unusual was the fact that uh, Charles Kowal was his name. And he also unusually had quite a deep knowledge of mythology. So because of where Chiron was when it was discovered, so in between Saturn and Uranus, he thought, well, this must have something to do, you know, to the name must have something to do with Saturn and Uranus because you know, it's kind of in that lineage, just positionally in the sky. And so he obviously knew the story of Chiron and named it that, and the name stuck. Because often what happens is the discoverer may propose a name, and then it can even be months or years before that name is confirmed, because other people have the right to make suggestions and, you know, big committee and all of that. But it's stuck. And I was curious about the name because although, I, although I, I'm no scholar of mythology, but I did know about Chiron and his story. And just the whole notion of the wounded healer had already been a really important archetype for me there, you know, right from the, right from the time when I discovered astrology because of being off school, having been injured, <laughs> because I fell, you know. <laughs> um, and that's, of course, totally graphically descriptive, described in my horoscope. Mm -hmm. It was a broken shoulder, so Gemini, arms, hands, shoulders, you know, and all that. And, and, and my son is opposite Chiron very closely. 
so I did know about the story of Chiron and that that had already been meaningful in my life. So when when the when the first ephemerises came out, um, I saw that it was very closely opposite my son, and visually sort of a bit stuck out on its own in 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 my chart. And I sort of casually thought, wow, well, well, that should be easy to observe and and track and, you know. And shortly after that, I realized that Cairo was about to make conjunctions with all of my personal planets, one after the other, for a few years. So I casually thought, wow, well, I guess, you know, that should be a ringside seat in the themes of Chiron. So I started immediately putting it into the charts of clients that I would see. And I, I never interpreted it because I had no idea what to say or what it really was or anything. But I started a notebook, one of those ring ring binder files we used to use, you know. And I just put dividers in, you know, first house, second house, third house. I don't know. And I would just endlessly, endlessly make notes trying to figure out, you know, what the hell is this? Well, as my own transits hotted up, oh, my God, th then I knew that there was, there was, there was something there, and it was really doing stuff in my life. I won't tell you all of the dramas and <laughs> things <laughs> that went along with that, but it was absolutely extraordinary. And you know the the timing of the thing the things that were happening was so precise and the symbolism was so graphic <laughs> that i had i had no doubt there was something there you know and it's like i needed to know about it because i was in the middle of this huge chiron uproar in my own life and so i carried on i just Oh, and of course, this was long before the days of astrological computer programs. So I had to hand calculate Chiron and put it in the charts. Then I started going through books like the American Book of Charts. And there was another big horoscope collection, I forget. I went painstakingly through all those and started with people whose biography and life I knew a bit about. And then, you know, reading biographies and all that. So it, it's like the whole process was totally alive in me largely because of my transits and I, I remember thinking wow how would I be making sense of what's going on with me now if I didn't have this reference because really it was taking me to places that are just it's not the same territory as as the planets it really isn't so I just carried on studying and collecting and trying to survive my own Chiron transits. I, I was in a Jungian analysis at the time, which hugely helped. Be because, uh, you know, the, the world of symbolism and mythology and all that uh, is very important in the Jungian tradition. And, of course, that fits so well with astrology. And I, I went on like that for years and years. So it was 1978, I started re researching. I gave my very first talk on Chiron at the Astrological Lodge of London in 1985. I still have a recording of that. Oh, my God. <laughs> I sound like I'm about to die of fright, <laughs> <laughs> which is, that is how I felt, you know. And <laughs> it, it was the first time anyone had ever spoken about Chiron. In England, anyway. And um, now I was terrified that people would think I was crazy. And and I know for, for a fact that some people did. But hey, you know, there are worse things that can happen. <laughs> <laughs> so I just carried on and carried on. Now, Howard Sisportus, one of the founders of the Center for Psychological Astrology, as I ever mentioned, I had met Howard in my psychosynthesis training. And he also lived in the very same area of London that I did. So, you know, we used to meet for lunch sometimes and he was sort of a local friend for me. And he was also interested in Chiron. 
he has it exactly on his midheaven uh, in Scorpio. And he was himself very much a wounded healer. He actually had a, a congenital spinal condition at the top of his spine. Um, and so we would also, we would talk Chiron, very valuable conversations. And then in 1986, Howard had been asked by his publisher to kind of scout new titles and new authors in the field of astrology. So he knew I had like monstrous boxes of <laughs> research material already, just notes. Um, and of course, no internet. You know, I, I spent years doing research I could probably do in an hour or two with the, with the internet, you know. But, but that was fun. Fun, like cycling down to the British <laughs> Library on my bicycle. And they had a whole system where you, you, you had to put in a request for what you wanted to see. Fill in this little card. And they would tell you when you need to come back to see it. So you had to really be organized. It was, there was no <laughs> kind of browsing in the library and pulling things off shelves, not like back then. <laughs> and that was hugely fun. And I loved that reading room. It had this huge, it has still, but it's not in the same way anymore. It this absolutely enormous, it was a round room with an under an enormous dome, which was painted pale blue. And so it was like walking into the pale blue sky of the world of knowledge and intellect and everything. And another Gemini experience. <laughs> so anyway, Howard phoned me up and said, why don't you write a book on Chiron? Now, I honestly had never thought of writing a book. It, I, it never entered my mind, and if it had, I would have dismissed it and said, no, I couldn't possibly do that. So I kind of said all that to him, and he said, well, uh, what, he said, well, they're, they're only, the publishers, they only want 50 words, so write me 50 words. Said, okay. So publishers liked the 50 words. He said, okay, now we want 100. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, I can see where this is going. <laughs> And, I did that. and then he came back and he said, well, now we need a chapter structure. And I said, but how do you how do you write a chapter structure when you haven't written the book? Howard was an Aries <clears throat> with his son bang on my north node to the degree, north node in the sixth house. So he, he sort of did an Aries and said, oh, for God's sake, just do it. <laughs> Four words to that effect. <laughs> So I thought, okay, sat down at my desk. Oh, by that time, I did have a computer. Didn't have an astrology program yet, but I had a computer. I said, okay, if there was a book about Chiron, what would I want in it so I could learn about Chiron? <laughs> and so that, that was easy, you know, part one, part two, part three, part four, chapter one, two. And weirdly... Uh, with one change, that structure was the book. So the next thing I knew, I had a contract with Penguin. Wow. So that was, uh, I mean, incredible. First first publication with Penguin. Um, the, the way it got to Penguin was convoluted, but too boring to, to tell here. And then eventually um, it was, uh, it was, and, you know, I didn't know the title of the book until I'd finished the whole thing. And I kept worrying. I thought, God, how am I going to find a title? And then all of a sudden, one day I thought, oh, Chiron and the Healing Journey, because that is actually what it's about. <laughs> and then it was published in October of 19, 1989. Oh, and then just to, to round this off, I don't need to go into too much detail here because some of it's on my website. Uh, in 1992, that was the discovery of Pholus, and together with that was the discovery of the Kuiper belt, which is like a large donut ring that surrounds the solar system in which it's absolutely teeming with objects, which are gradually being subcategorized. And after Pholus, a number of other celestial objects were discovered that behaved a bit like Chiron. And so 
the subcategory of centaurs. Uh, that was the name given to these objects. And in honor of Chiron, who's like the chief centaur, uh, they were designated to be named after the, after centaurs in Greek mythology. So now a scholar amongst the early researchers found about 82 centaurs that were named in the Greek mythology. But to date, more than 500 <laughs> centaurs have been <laughs> discovered i mean celestial type centaurs so they're going to run out of names and they might not even bother to name them you know who knows so there's about 20 that have been named and so my dear my dear chiron friend brian clark in australia he was the one who first told me about the discovery of you know pholus it wasn't named immediately, but anyway, he told me about all this, and I just remember my reaction, which was an inward loud groan. And I thought, <laughs> oh, no, not more of these centaurs. <laughs> I, hope that, I hope they're not going to stampede over my microscope <laughs> again. <you know? laughs> and so he was faxing me. We, we, we faxed in those days, faxing me all these articles and things, and I would my eyes would pop with horror. <laughs> and, and I'd be polite and say, oh, thank you very much, Brian. <laughs> and screw them up and put them in the bin. <laughs> and then some really incredible synchronicities happened, which made it so clear to me that these these creatures, they sort of had me by the hair and saying, <laughs> okay, look here, you know, there's more. And you have to work on this. And I was just going, no, no, no. Mm. And then eventually... Um, an incredible story in 1994. Uh, what was it? 95, 94. Um, which is which is written, which is written up in another book of mine, and the story is on my website if you're curious. But I then began to work on another book, and the same thing happened. I just began putting them into horoscopes, and then both times when I was working with Chiron. And then trying to trying to figure out the centaurs as well. I just had in every single client that came to see me had something going on with one or other of these little critters, you know. And you know, this might sound wild or inflated or something, but there were times I really felt, you know, what is going on here? It's like they've stormed into my life. And the universe is kindly sending me clients who are going to teach me about how this stuff works. So I, I learned everything that I know, how much that is, <laughs> from, you know, uh, from my clients and, you know, all gratitude and blessings to them. So it was a major, major work again. Um, and then... So first it was Chiron, then a few years later it was Pholus and Nessus, then a few years after that uh, it was Sharikla, who's the wife of Chiron. Um, that was, and that had a whole thread of its own, really. So that was that was how I got into it. <laughs> a sky full of centaurs, as well as asteroids, because you know there are all of these asteroids that have been discovered as well. How do you feel about using one centaur versus another? Because I think one of the things that we find happening a lot now in astrology is that as more celestial objects get discovered, there is this urge to integrate them into our work to find out about what their meanings and what their significations are. Yeah, and at the same time, our our twelve slices of pizza chart for me it starts to look very cluttered because it's just yes. so much going on. So for you within your work, is there a, I guess the the word is a, a limit, <laughs> but but is there a, a place where you say, I have everything I need within these centaurs and no more or how how are you dealing with that mm, that's a great question so to start with um 
I, I'll just mention that I've also studied horary with both Jeffrey Cornelius and Deborah Holding. And so, you know, I loved working with the chart without the outer planets and, of course, no centaurs. Um, and I still do that if I do some horary work for somebody. What I tend to do is I start with, with just the visible planets and see see what that chart says. And if somehow it doesn't feel complete or full enough or whatever, I'll add in the outer planets. And if it's still not really clicking, then I'll add in the centaurs. I only use four, by the way because the rest I don't have that personal relationship with. So for me, that's the that's the guiding feature. Like I also don't regularly use the asteroids, not, not even the main four, because, uh, hey, I, I don't know how many there are. It's over, it's over 11,000 now, isn't it? I, I think I think there's like 20,000. <laughs> 20, oh, I'm way out of date. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> So I do use the asteroids and love them because I, I have, um, I have uh, uh, well, I count Demetra George as a friend and we have done some work together. So I follow the, the way she does it because it, it's very, very much um, looking for the precision, not wandering all over, you know, and I appreciate that. But I guess being a curious Gemini, I have tried numerous different kinds of things. I also worked with the TNOs for several years, and that was lovely. And I felt like I had some brief and very intense meetings, let's say, with a few of them, but I don't use those routinely. So when when I do a reading routinely, I'll use the visible planets plus the outer planets plus the four centaurs. And, um, and, and for me, that's enough. Now, occasionally, somebody will ask, specifically, they want to look at one of the TNOs or a bunch of the asteroids or so on, and I'm perfectly happy to include that because it's like they've been called into the consultation, if you know what I mean. Um, but for myself, I, I can't really work with anything, <laughs> and I mean including the visibles, unless I feel a really deep, sense of personal connection and in that sense you know I'm very grateful that I learned in the kind of back to front way that I did because you know the energy and the experiential sense of the planets as they move and make aspects and all that that was totally alive for me long before I really did any focused intellectual study and I, I sometimes wonder how I would have fared if I'd done it the other way around, you know, the normal way. I, I don't know how far I would have got because there's such an intense amount of study and knowledge to integrate, you know. But I did it inside out in the sense it was from my inner experience of them before I added on a whole lot of information and intellectual study. So that's that's still true for me. And that was why, you know, when, <laughs> when Brian was telling me about these new centers, <laughs> I was like, no, go away. It's too much work, too much study. But hmm. then, you know, it's like the energy connection happened and then the door opened and then I could study them kind of thing. So that's that's my kind of rule of thumb. If anything really speaks to me, I will listen to the best of my ability, but I, I won't sort of arbitrarily add stuff in out of curiosity. I may study them a little bit, but I won't actually work with them. I completely understand what you're saying and that approach. For me personally, for many years, I was very anti Chiron <laughs> because. Oh. <laughs> In a minute, you're not alone. <laughs> Because I I couldn't find a way to... So I think that we spoke about this once before, but I also practice Uranian astrology, purely Uranian astrology. And I practice very traditional Renaissance astrology. And when I'm 
practicing within the Renaissance framework, I'm only doing that. And when I'm practicing within the Uranian framework, I'm only doing that because I think that they work well in terms of corroborating each other, but I think they both work best separate. Yeah. And my Chiron story was that I felt more comfortable integrating Chiron on the dial. And, and even before that, I didn't feel comfortable integrating Chiron at all because my approach is that I don't really want to read what somebody else writes on a newer celestial object. If I'm going to use it at all, yeah. I'm going to do what you did and I'm going to put it in every client chart to see right, right, right. how it shows up. So there was one summer I was teaching a natal astrology intensive and for some reason Chiron was on my screen in Soul of Fire. I hadn't put it there, but it was there. And, <laughs> and, and this person had a story. This person had a moon Chiron square exact to the, to the minute actually. And the story that this person had was that she had such an awful relationship with her mother and it was terrible basically. And so in my mind, I, I said, well, let me try putting Chiron into charts and I will only look at moon Chiron aspects. And like you said, when you say to the universe, you're going to do something, the universe sends you 10, 20, 30 people exactly. <laughs> who have that in their charts. Oh, and, and everybody who started to come to me, they all had Moon square Chiron, Moon semi square Chiron, Moon sesqui quadrate Chiron, Moon parallel Chiron, Moon contra parallel Chiron, and they all had the same story. My mother doesn't love me. My mother never wanted kids. My mother said she was going to commit suicide. My mother did commit suicide. My mother locked herself in the room and took horse tranquilizers. It was all of these very awful stories about people's mothers, specifically, even if the moon was in Cancer. Even if the moon was in Taurus, even if the moon had no other hard aspects from any other planets, these moon Chiron stories all carried the same thread. And then after that, it became the Venus Chiron stories. And then after that, it right. became the Mercury. And so, so I'm a believer. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I've heard many other people um, tell stories like that. It, it's almost, it, It's almost like you know, Chiron gallops in, <laughs> gallops into your life and kind of grabs you by the hair and says, okay, <laughs> it's time you learn some things about me, yeah. kind of thing, you know? Yeah. I just now, a, a, question for, a question for you. So the more I worked with, with Chiron and also with these, you know, graphic, graphic stories, uh, you know, I remember one from this was the very early days of researching. You know, when, when a man who is a Sagittarius with Chiron in Sagittarius comes in limping, <laughs> right, with a wound on his thigh, I'm not making this up, <laughs> and and tells you that he got kicked by a horse. <laughs> it's like, what are you supposed to say? It's like, oh, excuse me while I faint. <laughs> 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 that really happened. And all, all kinds of things, and you will know this from your own journey with it. And then, but it's it's like it's like a living energy. But now, a question for you: One thing that I began to notice more and more and more was that the Chiron themes, the experiences related to the Chiron themes, they they have this nature of like opening up a wound which in some ways is incurable, like in the mythology. And yet it opens a portal which leads on to the healing journey. And so just like in the mythology of Chiron, uh, eventually he was healed of his wound by shifting to an entirely different level. So in the, myth in the story, in the mythology, you know, it's that he, he eventually dies because he trades places with Prometheus. And because being being an immortal or a demigod, um, he wasn't able to die from the wound he got, but neither was he able to heal it. Uh, and so 
he was eventually released by this kind of destiny swap with Prometheus. And so he was free to die. And at the same time, he transcended into his immortal self in the constellation of Centaurus, or some say Sagittarius. So it's like finding our own immortal self doesn't necessarily mean that that we have to die to do that. <laughs> you know, we may feel like we're dying many times. Uh, there can be many, many little mini deaths in our process of transformation. Each each of which brings us closer in contact to our own immortal self in the stars, so to speak. So yeah. that's how I would understand that. But on on the way, it's like the portal opens to the underworld. And you know, in the in the astronomy, there are so many things which link the orbits of Chiron and the orbits of Pluto. For example, both of them cross over the orbits of their nearest inner planet. And again, Dane Rudyard, I'm so sorry that he didn't live long enough to become to to meet Chiron and what he might have said about it. Oh, I'm curious about that. But anyway, he was, to my knowledge, the only astrologer who really picked up on this notion of orbit crossing. And spoke of it in his wonderful flowery language as a cosmic fecundation to make fertile, to bring in new cosmic energies from the, the, the outer reaches of space, you see. And as well, both Chiron and Pluto have very elliptical orbits, and the orbit is very steeply inclined to, to the ecliptic. Um, and also the, the current view about the origin of the centaurs astronomically is that they came from the Kuiper Belt. And we could think of Pluto perhaps as the king of the Kuiper Belt. And so the centaurs are like the, the emissaries or the escapees or the extensions of Pluto's theme. That's how, that's how I read them. Wow. Especially, especially with the notion of trauma and how that relates. Now, on any journey to the underworld, well, there's many different regions. <laughs> and the different regions of the underworld, of course, are beautifully described in Greek mythology. And, of course, in the magnificent work of Dante. Dante's Inferno. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> on the, 700, the 700th year of Dante's death, and it 700th death anniversary that was a couple of years back and I did a whole thing about about Dante even even though his horoscope is not confirmed the one I use it spoke so beautifully of this theme and you can see on his Chiron cycle all the major events that we do know the timing of in his life and so forth and his journey um to Helen back basically that is very plutonic and very chironic at the same time. So one of one of the one of the terrains, if that's the right world, right word, one of the terrains that we we may be introduced to or may be drawn into because there's work to be done there, is the realm of the ancestors. And you know, in our biographical life, it's often the tangles of our own biography that can obscure the incoming light um, that, that is, of course, within us, but we may not be in touch with it. It may be tangled up with the threads of our biographical complexity. And for some people, the same is also true in the ancestral tangle. And for some people, actually bearing witness to that and in that sense inviting healing inviting compassion inviting resolution becomes a major theme of their life inwardly now things are changing mercifully but even 20 years ago uh, 
I think the, the, the whole notion of transgenerational trauma was only just beginning to achieve credibility. Now, anyone in who works in any of the alternative medicine fields will, of course, not have known about that. You know, it's there in the tradition of Chinese medicine. It's there in Ayurveda. These are all thousands of years old, these traditions. But um, it hadn't yet resurfaced in the West, just kind of very slow to, to, to get it, you know. But that is changing. And now that notion is, well, bringing a lot of relief and clarification to a lot of people. You know, even just understanding the patterns is profoundly healing because then it's like you've been able to see with your own eyes and your own mind and heart things about the lives of your ancestors that may have never been processed because there was not enough support or no opportunity. So many, many, many of our ancestors went to their graves with heavy hearts. Now, in, in my understanding, after death, you know, people's process doesn't stop after they die. It continues. And so many people, as it were, work through a lot of the suffering of their lives that they might have had. And it can also be that there are some things that really get truly stuck. And those are those are the things that may well be handed on down the chain to the people who come after. So in other words, for us, it's our ancestors that might be calling because they they need our attention, and so they're trying to get our attention. And it's that that portal is one of the things that opens in the realm of the centaurs. Of that, I'm really sure. I also have the feeling. Uh, that to really get the centaurs, it's not really a case of interpreting them or saying what they mean. It's more, it's more again, back to front, like maybe I do everything back to front. <laughs> it's more back to front in the sense of it's learning how to listen. Listen to somebody's story but listen to the language and how they say things, the intonation, um, and, you know, it's the intuitive clues that are, that are coming into the field, which is the consultation, that may be speaking. And then more often than not, the person will begin to speak their Chiron or their other centaurs or whatever, because you have... Silently, you don't, you don't have to say anything. But if you're open to that field, it will open when you're with the client. And that might just invisibly give them permission to speak about the things. And then it's like the thread just unravels and unravels. And the meaning presents itself. You don't have to speculate. Or, you know, even, even if you do speculate a bit, and you get it wrong, that doesn't really matter. Because in the interest of a kind of of a kind of inquiry process, um it you know, the the right connection will appear in one way or another. And I personally find that very liberating because I think that it to me it seems clear that the centaurs signify a, an internal psychological and spiritual process which okay sometimes has these ridiculously graphic displays of the symbolism but not always it depends entirely on the person's nature and character and all of that but for people who are quite introverted or introspective would be a better way of putting it and who do have a a, 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 li a living connection with their own inner process um you usually they they get it immediately and there i find even there've been many times when you know it's it's 
it's obvious that there's something really centauric going on because of the transits and this and that. And sometimes, even very briefly, mentioning some of the key points of the mythology, and you can see the light bulbs going on in people, even if they never heard the story before, and they're not really interested in mythology, they get it. So I know this is a cliche, but I I feel that it's 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 often way more productive to approach the whole field of the centaurs, Chiron and the rest, the gang, you know, to approach them in a very right brain way and try to listen to what they are saying rather than impose. And, you know, because with the visible planets, especially, I mean, we have thousands of years worth of, of accumulated interpretation of them, which is wonderful. Obviously, we have less with the outer planets and even less with the T and O's. But, you know, we can we can describe what, let's say, um, Saturn in Capricorn, Trine Mercury in Virgo might be like. Out the blue, even if we haven't seen the chart, we don't see the person, haven't seen the person. Within a margin of error, we can make some very educated guesses, at, at least about the qualities of that aspect and likely manifestations of it and so on and so forth. Now, unless I'm just totally missing something, which I probably am, it doesn't quite work to approach the centaurs in that way, you know? And the, the cliche I was thinking of was left brain, right brain. So you can do left brain with information and interpretation and all that quite well with the visible planets and some to some degree with the outers as well. But I don't find that really works unless I just haven't understood that level of it. But where it absolutely comes to life and quickly um, is approaching it in this more right brain way. More, more with in a spirit of curiosity and from a position of totally not knowing, you know, because there's there's still not a great deal written about these creatures, <laughs> <laughs> um, and so it you know it's entirely fresh. It has to come out of the feet, the living field of of what one is exploring. But certainly, this thing about the ancestors, time and time again. Uh, and, okay, it's, it's very obvious sometimes with Pholus, another one of the centaurs. It's even there in the mythology, the mention of four generations. And uh, at first, I thought that was just a poetic way of saying a long time. But then the more, the more I worked with it, the, the more examples. I was finding, or that were coming to me, put it that way. I wasn't like out looking for it, you know. Um, and even so, if Pholus was there and making a transit, I, it got to the stage where I, I ventured to actually mention this theme of the four generations. Okay, so sometimes I'd barely finished the sentence, and the person said, "Oh my God, I know exactly what what you're referring to." Let me tell you the story, and then bang, bang, you know, there it was, the whole pattern. You know, I'm still, you know, whatever. And the other times, the person will say, no, I'm not really relating to that. Uh, and then, you know, a day later, a month, a year, years even, I'll get an email from it. You know, you told me about the four <laughs> generations. Well, let me tell you what I just discovered. Just incredible. Um. And so, you know, I think there, the the key with these things is is to be be comfortable in, on a on a base of truly not knowing, because that gives space for the thing to arise and inform me, or inform the client, you know. And that I find absolutely thrilling still, almost because they're not planets, okay, and so. I think, you know, maybe that the way that we are mostly taught to work with the planets and some of the techniques which have been, you know, handed down since God knows when, 
uh, it maybe doesn't work to try to squish Chiron into that kind of a model. What is clear to me is also that they, they seem to activate during periods of very strong tr transition. And, you know, I remember thinking way back when I was writing the book on Chiron and thinking about its position between Saturn and Uranus and the fact that they are the dual rulers, is how I think of them, of the sign of Aquarius. And so I, I was thinking, oh, well, maybe Chiron is something to do with, is part of the transition into the age of Aquarius, if we use that model, you know. And certainly it seems to open up a whole level of transition in somebody's life that's not related to the biological or sociological stages of one's life like Saturn definitely is you know this is more transition at the spiritual level I'm going to say on our journey of awakening which you know I, I believe everybody's on a journey of awakening and that doesn't mean everybody's journey looks the same. <laughs> it's very, very individual. And I think it's a very imp important too these days because the, ho the whole relationship with, with people to, their, to, the, to the whole notion of religion has changed enormously in the last few decades. Um, and there's a, there's a a great deal of questioning and soul searching and also grief around some of the stuff that's been happening, as well as, you know, a, a really strong uh, individual and inner revival of the need for the experience of some kind of spiritual connection, you know. And it's it's that living individual part of the journey that seems to be accentuated with the centaurs that's that's how i'd understand them i think it's so beautiful your perspective on the centaurs and your perspective on chiron and just how we can start to integrate these things into our astrology for people who feel drawn to bring that into their astrology i think that it's really great this notion of listening instead of saying which mm -hmm. i think when we look at how so much of traditional astrology is built it is really built in more of this saying model because like you've said we have so many thousands of years to have studied uh yeah. saturn jupiter mars sun venus mercury and moon we have all of these years behind us and so many generations and mm -hmm. now that we're on the verge or the cusp of a whole new world where there's so much change going on not only within our world but also within our astrology it does seem like it's time for us to listen and learn more deeply about how our astrology is evolving and shifting as we move towards the future yeah i do agree with that and also i don't see personally i don't see any negative polarization in that because another one of the processes that i think the centaurs are about well certainly chiron is it's the both and perspective so we don't have to like ditch ditch the traditional views you know from whatever period of, of astrology's history we don't have to ditch that or disrespect it or you know get into a, a kind of thing of who's right and who's wrong and all of that we don't really have to do that but you know for, for me it working let me quote Richard Tarnas so this is 1994 a conference in England in Canterbury and there was a panel discussion at the end um, with people able to ask questions so on the panel was me, Stanislav Groff, Richard Tarnas, Nick Campion, and a couple of oh, Mavis Klein, who's no longer with us, and Charles Harvey, who's also no longer with us. And one young student put up her hand, and she was expressing 
some anxiety and confusion around not knowing what to work with in a chart. Now, in fact, she was referring to the whole plethora of techniques that she'd been encountering in conferences and classes and all the rest of it. And I'll never forget Rick Tarnas's reply. He said this, in astrology, you can only work with what is burnished into your soul. I never forgot that. Uh, years afterwards, when, when I saw him, I reminded him of that. Of course, he didn't even remember that he'd said that. But there was, and probably still is, a recording of that. So I'm not making it up. And I love that because there's a difference between having knowledge about something and having it burnished into your soul. Because that's like that's like a full full body, full heart, full mind, full everything experience that's unmistakable. There's, there's no, there's no, is this right or is this wrong or whatever? It's just, wow, you know, like that. I think that's so special. And Rick is someone who I have a lot of respect for, and he is also given me some guidance on my journey as a writer as well. And I think this notion of only working with what's already within you is really powerful. And when I think about my astrological techniques that I use, I use things that resonate with me. And I think even though that's kind of the cliche, you know, we say use what works for you. But I think at the end of the day, all of us as astrologers, we really do have to use what works for us because absolutely it, it's not just um it's not just a left brain endeavor, you know, astrology yes, yes. is also so Tell me. I'm oh, sorry. That's <laughs> one of the things that totally thrilled me about your presentation for the Mayo School Conference. And, you know, I loved, I loved the way you were able to keep going at such a pace, so fast, with so much information. And unusually, I, find my, I found myself, I, I, I was really with you. I was getting it <laughs> because I, I could feel that you absolutely embodied the experience <laughs> of working with the stuff. This was not just information. This was, for me, this was a real deal. This <laughs> fabulous. <laughs> you know, truly, when, when I heard you give the presentation, I was mind boggled by the amount of precision, precision and, well, as a presentation, you know, the speed and the amount of precision and information and so forth which because of where I felt you were coming from energetically, if you know what I mean, it all was so digestible because you were not grinding any axes <laughs> or trying to prove that you had you were the way, the truth, and the light or anything like that. And honestly, if people do that, even if it's kind of subtle, my mind just shuts down. I can't take it in. And so I thought, you know, this is a complete wow. And I and I got all excited. I thought, oh, my God, you know, you're representing the astrologer of the future. Like, you know, really. Mm. Wow. No, I mean, I, I really mean that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate that. And I've I've been putting in the work and and you certainly have, my God. You also <laughs> got you know achievement up your arm. You've got all the credits <laughs> and the attainments and wow, you know. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, thank, <laughs> thank you. I mean um, this has been this has been such a treat for me to be able to be here with you and speak with you. I have known about you for about as long as I've been practicing astrology, and I'm I'm so thrilled to have had this opportunity to speak with you right now. Well, it's been a thrill for me too. I I probably could have talked with you for another couple of hours. <laughs> <laughs> Assuming you'd want to, you know. <laughs> I would. We'll save that for next time. Okay. Listen, listen, good. Melanie, tell us and tell our listeners and viewers 
about anything you have coming up, whether it's a class or if someone wanted to work with you specifically, how could they find out more about your work? Okay. I do have a website. It's just my name.com, Melanie Reinhardt.com. Uh, it, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a, how shall I describe it? Jungle. It's a bit <laughs> of a jungle and <laughs> it needs some pruning, but there's lots of stuff on there. Um, there is a whole section on the centaurs, including ephemeris material um, and a, dis a description of my introduction to Pholus and Nessus. That's a fantastic story. I encourage, encourage you to read that. And there is a bookshop. You can buy books there. So at the moment, I'm not taking on any new clients. And in fact, I'm having a sabbatical for the rest of this year on readings. I, I think there may be something else that, that I need to do, but I'm not sure. But um, uh, I do I do have a subscription list. You can join that on my from my website. Uh, next thing up is that there's a very wonderful symposium going all the way through June. I'm not organizing this. A wonderful lady called uh, Martha Hines, she's organizing it. And there's lots and lots of people. And the theme is called Rebecoming the One. So that there's lots of things about Mars and Venus themes, gender themes, sexual themes, and so forth. But in the context of Becoming the One, which of course is an ancient mystical concept, very, very meaningful in these times where everything is polarizing and splintering and so forth. So I, I have a presentation on that. And then in August, I'll be I'll be teaching at the Faculty of Astrological Studies Summer School. Um, and I think the links are already up on my website. There is an events, an events page. And I'm also doing a few bits of teaching which are, are not, strictly speaking, open to the public. But if you keep your eye on my website or my newsletters, it will let you know what I'm up to. I will put all of the links down below so that people can continue to follow your amazing work. Okay, thank you. Melanie, thank you so much for today. And I just want to say to those of you who are listening to this right now, whether this is your first time or your hundredth time joining us here on the Iraqlos podcast, it is my great joy to bring you interviews with people such as Melanie Reinhardt. So if you've enjoyed this podcast today, then by all means, please like this episode, subscribe to the Iraqlos podcast, as well as share this podcast with your other astrologically minded friends. Until next time. See you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Melanie Reinhardt. Thank Thanks you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. This was this was so amazing. I really enjoyed this. You're very welcome, really. Thank you. Thank Be you. Before our time to meet today, I got a bit anxious because, you know, in the last couple of years, I've been really fortunate in in that there's quite a number of people who've asked to interview me on their podcast. And of course, I always say yes, you know, <laughs> because, <laughs> you know uh, and all lovely, uh, lovely astrological folks, some of whom I already knew, you know, and it's just been wonderful. And I suddenly thought, oh, my God, maybe I'm just telling the same story over and over and over again. <laughs> and I thought, well, probably... You know, each person who has their own podcast has their own audience as well. Um, that was my moment of anxiety before <laughs> before doing this. Well, I can tell you, I've never heard you on anybody else's podcast, and I've I've learned so much today, and and I enjoyed it. And so, thank you so much for sharing. It it felt real, and it felt like it came from your heart, and and I appreciate that.